One of the most common things you hear from men, everybody needs something from me. My family needs something from me. My parents need something from me. My kids need something from me. My wife needs something from me. My in-laws need something from me. My boss needs something from me. Everybody needs something. And if they get a phone call, it's not going to be about them. Hey, I just wanted to say salam. Are you doing okay? Is everything all right with you? Let's get together sometime. And even if someone calls and says, Assalamu alaikum, how are you? Already in your head is how are you, but what do you really want? You know, what's this call for? Nobody's getting in touch with you because they care about you. They're getting in touch with you because they care about something you can give them. Either you're a cash register or you're a service dispenser, you're a tool to be used, and that's it, nobody else cares about you. Nobody actually sees you for who you are, right? And then you come to the masjid and you hear Muslims are all brothers. Assalamu alaikum brother, and you give each other hugs and salams and dua for each other and all of that, that's great. And the moment you say, hey, um, can I talk to you for a minute? I'm busy. I'm, I'm kind of busy right now. Nobody has time for you. And take it a step further, in many families, people depend on you. You're providing, for example, right? And then all of a sudden you get sick and you lose your job. Not only do you lose your job, you lose your respect in the family. People don't look at you the same way anymore. In fact, they're avoiding you as best as possible. You know why? Because all of a sudden, you went from someone who was giving to someone who might be asking. So let's stay away from someone who might be asking. If this is the condition even inside of our families, what do you imagine is the condition when we expand that a little bit to a level of a community? It's demonstrated over and over again that even though there is some level of camaraderie between us, salam and dua between us, it doesn't go past formalities. It's not actual brotherhood. Here's the litmus test for what real brotherhood looks like. If I'm really going through a crisis, if there's something terrible I'm going through, is there someone I can call immediately? And would it be the brothers at the masjid? And if you have those people in your life, then you have some level of brotherhood in your life. But if you have to think twice, if I tell this person, what are they going to think of me? If I tell this person, how will they use it against me? You have to calculate whether or not you should share what's troubling you with someone because you don't know if they're going to go talk to 20 other people about you. You know what this brother told me? He was going through, oh my God. You don't want to become somebody else's entertaining story. So you keep your mouth shut. You know what that means? You don't have brotherhood in your life. Take another step. There are people in our community, young men, older men, that fail. Failure is a part of life. You fail in an exam. It happens. You fail in a job interview. It happens. You can also fail in your Dean. Some young man can go through some depression and start drinking alcohol. It happens. Somebody might end up in haram situations, might go down a path, drugs, alcohol, you name it, all of it. If you had a family member, if you were walking with your child and your child fell, what would you do? You would just pick them up, scrape them off, put some band-aid on, put some antiseptic on. Let's heal this person. Let's fix them. What happens in our communities, in our circles, when somebody falls? Oh my God. Astaghfirullah. Look at the youth nowadays. You know what I found out, Abdul Karim? You know what he's doing? I saw him coming out of this place. Bro, somebody should talk to him. You know what that is? That person may be doing a sin. I would argue you're doing a much bigger sin. If that is a crime against Allah, you running your mouth about the dignity of your fellow brother to other people, and then saying Astaghfirullah as if you genuinely care. Because if you genuinely cared, number one, your mouth would be shut. And the only time it would open is to go reach out to him and give him a hug and say, hey, I'm here for you if you ever need to talk and it will die with me. That would be you as a brother. This whole, I'm so concerned about our youth and this is not brotherhood. I don't know what that is. Backstabbing at least, that's what that is. But that's the reality that we've created for ourselves. And then we have the audacity to say, why isn't the Ummah united? The billions of us. Man, can you show me a dozen of us united? How about two dozen? How about a couple of hundred? Before we talk about billions of people being united. Rasulullah was given a remarkable victory at Khaybar. Before Khaybar, Muslims were basically bankrupt, basically had no money. After Khaybar, all of a sudden, we were millionaires. Millions came in in assets, if you want to count it in today's values. Millions in real estate, agriculture, recurring revenues, all of that, all of a sudden came into Medina. And just before this happened, the Muslims were barely getting by. I mean, there are narrations of the Prophet himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, having to turn his daughter away because he didn't have food to even give her while she was starving for three days herself. And he had stones tied to his belly because of the, the pains in his own stomach. This was the governor of Medina, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, starving. And then after Khaybar, all of a sudden, millions have come in. Now, let's think about this for a second. The Muhajirun came from Mecca, yes? They left everything behind. But the people in Medina were poor to begin with. They weren't rich. They didn't have a three-bedroom house. They didn't have a two-bedroom house. They didn't even have bedrooms. But now all these people came and they got to stay somewhere. And so what did the Ansar do? They housed the Muhajirun. Now they barely had enough food for themselves. Now they've got more mouths to feed. Then on top of that, 
six months after the Prophet ﷺ gets to Medina, we're getting ready for war. But it is about to happen. And when you're preparing for war, if you know nothing about war, you should know war is expensive. Who's gonna spend the money on war? Well, the Muhajirun don't have any money because they left all of their money behind. Who's gonna do all the expense? Who's gonna have to make all the money and spend it? It's gonna be the Ansar. So the Ansar are taking care of the Muhajirun and now they're financing the bulk of whatever they can come up with to fight for the cause of Allah. From their perspective, as soon as they accepted Islam, they don't have their private life anymore. They have to share their little tiny space with somebody else. They can't eat a meal by themselves. Somebody else has to share that meal with them. And on top of that, they're going to war. And the majority of the shahada, the majority of the people that were killed in both Badr and Uhud were the Ansar. They were the people of Medina. So we're spending, we're giving up our homes, and we're getting killed. And they kept giving and giving and giving and giving and giving. And finally, we're millionaires. Khaybar what happens? We got the millions. So if I'm an Ansari, and I'm not, but I use my imagination. If I was one of the Ansari, I'm like, finally, time for some refund. So I'm waiting for the announcement. Listen to these ayat. Ma afa Allahu ala rasulihi. Whatever Allah allowed to be acquired through His Messenger, min ahlul qura, from the people of those towns, meaning Khaybar, falillah, it belongs to Allah. Number one, a share goes for Allah. Next. Walil Rasul. Oh, next one, it goes to the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Rasul and his family. Okay, all right, that's, that, that's fine. Walidil qurba, and close relatives. Waliyatama, and orphans. And I'm the Ansari looking around like, okay, okay, orphans. Well, masakin and poor people. Okay, 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 now the poor people are done. Can we get to us now? Wabn sabil And even people who are traveling and they need help. Money will go to them. And then Allah says, by the end of this ayah, He says, Ma'atakum rasulu fa Whatever policy the messenger gives you, take it. anhu fantahu. And whatever he stops you from, stop yourself. Right? Okay, now in the next ayah, next recipients. Lil fuqara il muhajirin al ladina ukhriju min diyalihim wa amwalihim yabtaguna fadlam min Allahi wa ridwana. For the bankrupt migrants who were kicked out of their homes and were expelled from their own assets and their wealth, who pursued a pleasure of Allah, and they've pursued the favor from Allah and to please Him. They're the next recipients. That's a lot of recipients. Although that money is now being split up, but who hasn't been mentioned yet? The Ansar have not been mentioned. And the Ansar were the ones who spent most of the money and they haven't been mentioned. And then finally Allah gets to them and says, But just look at how Allah talks about them. I did all of this just to tell you how Allah talks about them. Those people who who made ample space in their homes and they made ample space for faith. Just like you open your home, they open their iman. Now Allah is telling us something. Part of my iman is how much space do I make for my fellow brother? It's part of my iman. Iman is not just in salah. Iman is when I open up my heart for my fellow brother. And Allah says, these people, they had open hearts. In other words, I was pretending to be annoyed that the Ansar were not mentioned. The Ansar never felt that. Min qablim, from even before them. Yuhibbuna man hajara ilayhim. These words are so easy to recite, so hard to understand. He says, they love those who migrated towards them. Ya Allah. Yuhibbuna man hajara ilayhim. And they don't allow for any discomfort in their chest because of whatever responsibilities they were given. They never feel discomforted because they're helping someone. They're never feeling discomforted because that's my brother, that's my sister, that's my family. Allah said, that's my family. This bond of la ilaha illallah, it's thicker than blood. That's all that matters. Family first, ummah first. This is their mindset. And they give other people preference over themselves, even though themselves they are starving. And he ends with, Whoever can protect themselves from the greed and the selfishness that they have inside of themselves, like I need protection from a part of myself. Inside myself is greed and selfishness. All of us have it. Allah says we have shuh. And we need protection, not just from shaitan, not just from the enemy. I need protection from my own shuh. People who can be protected from that inside of themselves, those are the people that have achieved success. I want myself, I want you, in our immediate circles, to start rethinking what unity means. True unity, you see your brother, the moment they say salam to you, everything else, every other filter disappears. That's it, that's all you get. They say salam to you, they are your brother, you're there for them, they're there for you. We're supposed to be the people of haq, right? We're supposed to be the people adillatin ala al-mu'mineen. We're supposed to be yu'thiruna ala anfusi. We need to nurture care. We need to nurture ukhuwa. That's where unity comes from. It doesn't come from videos and speeches and talks. It comes from you and me actually connecting, deeply connecting. Allah Azza wa make us a people of genuine unity.